Well, it's good to see you back here again this week. Uh, this week's subject is going to be, or I should say this weekend, but this weekend's subject is all about this Bible. Uh, I keep hearing it, time in, time out, that this book was written by men. So if men wrote it, wouldn't there be mistakes? I mean, logically, it would seem logical that if 40 different men wrote 66 books in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, 27 books in the New, um, if men wrote them, 40 different guys, over 1,500 years, over three different continents, and most of them really never knew each other, they couldn't, 1,500 years, they didn't live that long then, so if they didn't know each other, and they all wrote 66 books, wouldn't you think it would be absolutely rife or full of mistakes? A lot of people ap uh, actually say that and they believe it. Uh, I can't get into that book because, I mean, men wrote it. So if men wrote it, then it's subject to failure. And then uh, anybody reading the book, is what I hear too, is how can I believe what people who read it, like pastors, rabbis, priests, whatever, whoever allegedly reads the Bible and preaches it to us, hey, it's all open to their interpretation. That part is true, because I could give you one verse and have three different people sitting right next to me, and you'd have four different, you could possibly have four different interpretations of what that Bible verse said. So therein lies the problem. But I have to tell you this, because your eternal destiny, your eternal life, has to be totally, absolutely dependent on your understanding of what is in this Word of God, and your understanding of, do you believe that this book was inspired by God, what that means is God breathed, what that means is that God told 40 different men through Jesus in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, he directly spoke to the prophets and told them exactly what to write down in the Old Testament books and they wrote it exactly the way God said it. Now what you may not know is this, if a prophet of God back in the Old Testament uh, prophesied 99 times and on the 100th time he got it wrong, he was subject to being put to death. So nobody really wanted to be a prophet, but God selected the men and then told them, write this down. Now, in those days of the Old Testament, they wrote down exactly what God told them to write down. And... Uh, and they had no clue, really, of uh, some of the things that they wrote, meaning this. In the Old Testament, there were over 300 prophecies that a Messiah and a Savior would come, that this one would be born in Bethlehem, that this one, this is the book of Isaiah, and uh, even as far back as Daniel, and uh, another prophet was King David, and all the way through the Old Testament. A Savior would come, he would be born in Bethlehem, he would be born of a virgin, uh, he would be hanged on a tree, they didn't know what the word crucify meant back then, but David said <clears throat> he would be uh, hanged on a tree, that people would gather around him and mock him, which they did on the cross, that people would gather around and take his garments and cast lots for them, saying uh, one of them would win, you know, where the biggest stone or straw or whatever they used for lots. Uh, all of this was prophe prophesied. Over 300 of them talking about the coming of this one called Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. So, but again, the prophets had really no concept of what crucifixion would be and all this kind of stuff. They just wrote down what God inspired them to write down. Now, you, I, for me to sit here and say, well, you know, I'm saying it, so therefore you've got to believe that when I tell you God inspired the Word of God and told men what to write, 
It does me no good. It does you no good. That's only my opinion, right? So what I want to do is go into this same book and gather up what others said about the Old Testament prophets. For example, what did Peter say? Well, Peter, as most of you know, was a friend of Jesus. He walked and talked with Jesus for at least three and a half years. He witnessed uh, everything, the miracles that Jesus did. And then after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus got together with his apostles and his writers of the New Testament, like Luke was not an apostle, but he certainly was a writer of the book of Luke, and he also wrote the book of Acts. Well, Jesus told them the essentials of what to say, what to write down, but he also said that, uh, well, I'll get to that in just a minute, because if I say it and I give you a story, I'd rather read it right out of God's Word, then you have to believe it or not, because as I said earlier, your eternal destiny, where your spirit will spend eternity, depends on your interpretation of that Bible and your belief whether or not that Bible was inspired by God himself and not thought up or written. You know, it would be nice to write the book of uh, Genesis down. Uh, Moses wrote the five, first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. Um, so God brought to his memory, write this down. Here's what's recorded. Here's what was recorded on parchment by people that came before you. Um, so that's how this was brought about. But let me prove it out because I always like to prove it. Now, here's why I say your eternal life depends on your interpretation, not a rabbi, a priest, a pastor, a guru, none of that stuff. It's your interpretation and your belief as to whether this Bible is true or not true. You're staking your entire eternity, whether it's going to be spent in the lake of fire. Well, John, I, that can't be right. I'm a good person. Let me cover that because it's in the Bible. Again, Jesus wants you to know your eternal life is based on what he wrote and if you believe he wrote it and if you believe he inspired his guys to write it the New Testament that is and if he said what they're quoting him as saying if that's true then your eternal destiny depends on your belief that this was inspired by God and by Jesus and that what he says is true so now let's go uh, set an example of what he said for example, over in uh, the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John was his friend. John was an apostle. John wrote um, the book of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. So five of those New Testament books were written by John. Now, John quoted Jesus as saying, because he walked and talked with him, but he quoted Jesus as saying this, and this is out of Jesus' own mouth as recorded in the history book called the New Testament. John 3, 1 through 7. Jesus speaking. He says, there was a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. A Pharisee was a Jewish lawyer in charge of all of the rules and regulations, if you will, the ordinances of the Old Testament as they brought them to the nation of Israel in the temple. These guys made sure that the law uh, the commandments of the Old Testament were carried out by the Jews, the nation of Israel. So Jesus is saying, this one called Nicodemus came to see me at night, secretly. The reason Nicodemus, the Pharisee, came to see Jesus at night and secretly was pretty obvious. He didn't want his fellow Pharisees, who really didn't like Jesus at all, in fact, were conspiring to kill him, but this Nicodemus... Uh, really wanted to discover for himself the truth because he really believed after seeing all these miracles that Jesus was doing that he was sent by God to teach the nation of Israel. Let me explain what I say here. Uh, but, so he came to Jesus and he said this, Rabbi, uh, which means teacher, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your, your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. So he really did believe. He was sincere and just wanted to get Jesus' exact words. Jesus said this, 
in verse 3, John 3, 3. It says, Jesus replied, he says, I tell you the truth, Nicodemus, unless you and everybody else, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. The Nicodemus said, well, what do you mean? I'm old. Uh, are you saying, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born all over again? Jesus replied, I assure you, Nicodemus, that no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and born of spirit. So now Jesus is telling them basically what the two most important words in the Bible are, born again. Because Jesus said, if you are not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Um, Jesus went on to say to Nicodemus, humans can reproduce only human life, which means babies are born and they're born in water within the mother's womb. That's how they are born. They're born in water. And he says, unless you are born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot see eternal life in heaven. He says, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. In other words, you have to do two things. One, be born of water in your mother's womb. Uh, otherwise, if you're not born and if you're not a human, we have no point to get to the second point. But the second birth, he says, is to be born of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who gives birth to spiritual life. And I'm going to explain to you how that happens because these are the two most important words in this entire Bible. Born again. You must be born again, or you cannot see the kingdom of God. I didn't say it. I don't know if your preacher, pastor, rabbi ever says it, but Jesus said it. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was a teacher, recognized by Nicodemus, a Pharisee in the Jewish temple. He believed what he said. But let me continue on. Uh, so Jesus was saying, therefore, there's no other way for a human being to get into heaven uh, if the Bible is correct, and remember, we started out by saying, if the Bible is correct, and it was written by men, are you going to believe what the Bible says or not? Let's find out. Jesus is saying, there's one way to get into heaven. What is it? To be born again. We cannot pray our way into heaven. The Bible is clear about that. We cannot buy our way into heaven. We cannot work our way into heaven with good deeds. In fact, Paul, another apostle of Jesus, who was mainly known as the preacher to the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews, like us, uh, for the most part, although some of my Jewish friends do listen in. Uh, so Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. He wrote 11 books out of the New Testament, but one of them was the book of Ephesians. And in there, he said this to the people. God saved you by His grace when? When you believed. And you cannot take credit for this. It is a gift of God. Salvation, Paul says, is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. In other words, Paul is saying, look, you can't get into heaven by doing good works. I don't care how good you are. And I could go on with at least two stories right now. Uh, where somebody asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? Or they asked the Apostle Paul, what the jailer did, what must I do to be saved? And he explained it to them. You must be, basically, you must be born again. That's it. You must believe. So Paul's saying, God saves you by His grace. His grace was that He set a plan out way in the beginning for salvation so that you did not have to end up in that lake of fire and you could get into heaven. By how? By going through His Son who died on the cross for your sins and mine. That's born again. Born of the Spirit. And I'll explain what Jesus meant when He says born of the Spirit in a little more detail in case you're still a bit cloudy. So Paul says, therefore, the only way to get into heaven is to believe all that Jesus said. Let me read it again. God saved you by His grace when you believed. So the first step in obtaining uh, this born-again experience with God, this relationship with God, this reconciliation with God is through His Son. 
When you believe, God saved you by His grace. Okay, let's move on. Fine, you say, well, what does all that mean? Uh, and if men wrote the Bible, why should I believe those guys? Fair question, so let's continue on. Remember what Jesus told us uh, is true. Unless a man is born again, or woman, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, I repeat, your eternal destiny is based on whether you believe that what Jesus said in this book did he and God inspire men to write down exactly what they told him to write, or did they not? If you do not believe that they did, and you believe that Jesus was a good guy, he was a prophet, and he, he, sure, he healed a few people. Oh, sure, he raised people from the dead, which nobody's ever done. No other prophet on the planet, ever. So if you're following a prophet, a guru, uh, whatever, a statue, it doesn't make any difference. They all died. Jesus was the only one resurrected. None of them raised people from the dead. Jesus raised people from the dead, caused the blind to see, caused the deaf to hear, caused the lame to get up and walk right in front of witnesses. Let me continue on. Peter, an apostle and friend of Jesus, who knew Jesus, who again, who walked with Jesus for the three and a half years, he said uh, this about the Old Testament prophets who, as I already pointed out, uh, wrote down at least 300 prophecies of this coming Jesus, this coming Messiah. He said the reward for trusting Jesus will be the salvation of your soul. Therefore, not by good works, not by buying your way in like I said, but Peter himself says in the Bible, if you're to believe what he said, and if you're to believe that Jesus told him what to write, and we'll prove that in just a minute, he said the reward for trusting Jesus and believing everything he said is your salvation, the salvation of your souls. And this, he goes on to say, this salvation was something that even the prophets wanted to know more about when they foretold of his gracious salvation prepared for you by God beforehand, way back in the beginning, God had a salvation plan, and that would be to send his own son to the earth to die on the cross for your sins and mine. That is the plan of salvation. So Peter's saying the reward for trusting Jesus and believing everything that he did and said, and why wouldn't you, then that reward is the salvation of your souls. Conversely, if you fail to believe the Bible or what Jesus said, then it's to the ruination of your soul, which means it will not ever enter into the kingdom of heaven because your soul will not be born again, which comes after trusting Jesus. That's your reward. Okay, um, Peter said this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. He says, above all, talking to a crowd, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. Therefore, he's saying what I already told you, and I get it from the Bible, and I believe it. But he says, uh, no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding. It's not, the, what it says in the King James Version, is it's not open to private interpretation, the Scriptures. That doesn't mean, like some people confuse it, oh, that means I'm not supposed to interpret it, you're not supposed to, no. The prophets who wrote that book were not, it was not open to their private interpretation. It was only open to God's divine inspiration to them to tell them exactly what to write. They couldn't go make stuff up, is what Peter's saying. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophets' own understanding or from human initiative. They couldn't act on their own. Again, if they said something and did something wrong in that Bible, they weren't a prophet anymore, that's for sure. And God would never allow them to write anything that he did not specifically tell them to write. So he says, Peter says, no, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. They spoke only from God. As God spoke to them in the ear, they would write uh, down their notes and they assembled them all together and then uh, the... Old Testament was assembled and then the New Testament was assembled 
later on, and we'll get into when that happened, when the whole Bible, all 66 books, were canonized or assembled uh, into one big book, which we now enjoy. Um, what about the New Testament authors then? Now, okay, let's say that Peter's right and the Old Testament prophets were inspired to write only exactly the words that God gave them. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Now, the books of Timothy, 1 and 2 Timothy, you think were written by a guy named Timothy. No, Paul the Apostle wrote them and he was writing to his friend who was also his uh, colleague, Timothy. Um, here's what he said in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 about the inspiration of the new guys. He says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to, let me just stop there. Paul the Apostle, the greatest apostle probably who ever lived, says all Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, all Scripture, all Bible words are inspired by God, period. What are they there for? He goes on to say, they are useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do right. And verse 17, he says, God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So therefore, all scripture, Old Testament and New, is inspired by God. But let's move on a little quicker so we can prove this up. Jesus himself tells us that um, he spoke to his apostles when he was with them. He was with them for three and a half years. He died on the cross for your sins and mine. He was raised again three days later, called the resurrection. He then went into the upper room to speak with his apostles. There he also instructed them for the next 40 days about uh, what he wanted them to do, uh, how he wanted them to preach with boldness. But he says, you can't do anything until I leave here and go back to heaven where I came from, then I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And once the Holy Spirit indwells in you, he has a certain function. Let me get over that. Uh, in John chapter 16, verse 7 through 13, John says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you. This is Jesus talking to his apostles. John's sitting there recording it. You got it so far? And he's saying, Jesus said this, Nevertheless, I say to you, apostles, uh, the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away, back to heaven. Because if I don't go away, I mean, he, God's plan was that Jesus would come as Savior, die on the cross, uh, be resurrected, spend the 40 days with his apostles, then he, he wanted him to come back into heaven, where he belonged, where he always was since the beginning. John records what Jesus says. He says, if I don't go away, then I cannot send the Holy Spirit to you. Uh, but if I depart, if I go back to heaven, I will send my Holy Spirit to you. Here's what he will do. Verse 8. And when he comes to you, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Then Jesus spells it out further. Verse 9. He will reprove the world of sin because they don't believe in me. That's the sin. The Bible says uh, the wages of sin is death, eternal death. And to reject what Jesus did on the cross and not believe what he says, Jesus says that's the sin. That's the unpardonable sin, really, that they believe not on me. The Holy Spirit will convict people that they, and he will get to every one of us, by the way. We know we're sinners, we'll know that we uh, need a savior, he talks to us, and then many of us, about 90%, absolutely reject it, deny it. And uh, the Bible's clear about that, too. It says, uh, broad is the highway into hell, basically, but narrow is the road to heaven. Why is that? Because very few people sit down and absolutely believe this book, that it was inspired and written by God, and now we're discovering, uh, through Jesus talking with his apostles and his writers, like Luke and a few others. Uh, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you will not see me physically anymore. And he will bring the Holy Spirit when he comes to you, when I leave, <clears throat> will 
um, bring judgment because the prince of this world, which is Satan, is already judged and condemned, as will all those who follow Satan by not believing in Christ and not accepting him as Lord and Savior. They all will end up in that lake of fire, unfortunately. Verse 12, John says, I have many things, John says that, John records that Jesus said, I have many things to say unto you apostles, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, I've got a whole bunch of things I want to tell you to finish writing the New Testament. But he says, I can't do it because you can't, there's so much there that you can't handle it right now. <clears throat> and it would take him too long and he was going to go back to heaven. But he continues on to say, but when he, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that is from, remember, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come to the apostles and to anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved. The Holy Spirit will indwell you, um, and that Holy Spirit shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear from God, then he shall speak those words to you, and then the writers here of the New Testament could finish writing the books. He will tell you what to write down. Uh, he will show you things to come. In other words, John wrote the book of Revelation. That hasn't come yet. That's the last days we're talking about. And Jesus says, he will show you things to come. And I want you to write it in the book. John wrote the book of Revelation. Now, what you need to know is that around the years 117 uh, to 130 AD is when the entire Old Testament and New Testament were all assembled together into what we call the 66 books of the Bible. Uh, that's when all of this uh, got assembled. And then in 1611, uh, King James authorized this King James Bible uh, with all 66 books in it. So, now we should know that Jesus told all the prophets what to write down. God told all the Old Testament prophets. Jesus told all the New Testament prophets exactly what to write down. Therefore, every word in this book is inspired by Jesus or God. Uh, therefore, we have to pay particular attention when Jesus said, unless a man or a woman be born again, born of water, born human, then born of the Spirit, they can in no way enter into the kingdom of heaven. Just so you know that, you know, if you reject them, you, then it's not like God's picking on you. He's set out the rules. Here they are. I'm reading them off to you. Jesus said it. Unless you're born again, you can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not on good works. Like I said, there's no way to get into heaven unless you're born again. Okay, that's accepting what Jesus said, accepting him as Lord and Savior, asking him to forgive you of your sins because he paid for your sins on the cross. Then, when you ask him, then he says, I will send my Holy Spirit to you and my Holy Spirit will indwell in you, be baptized into you. In other words, he's saying uh, to Nicodemus earlier on, when you're born of uh, a human, you're born in water, you're immersed in water. And then you heard, you know, somebody, a woman says, my water broke. Well, that means she's pretty near uh, ready to give birth to son or daughter. And Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit becomes immersed into you until the day of salvation, which means until your death, at which point your spirit goes absent from the body to be present with the Lord immediately you're rushing into heaven by angels and uh, the Holy Spirit is immersed into uh, those who believe everything that Jesus said and who become saved that's what it's called born again another word for saved and when you become born again and the Holy Spirit dwells with you until the day of salvation it also could mean and does mean at one point in the near future, a rapture will take place, in which case, God says, the Holy Spirit and everybody whom, in whom he dwells, everybody, all the saints, are taken up in the clouds to, 
meet Jesus in the air, and off uh, all the saints go to heaven. And when they go, the Bible says, he who restrains, in other words, he who is stifling the devil and keeping him in his place, I mean, we know how much sin is here now, but at that point in the rapture, the Holy Spirit and all the saints are going to be raptured or taken up into heaven. And Satan is let loose for 42 months upon the earth to rule. Satan's going to rule. Imagine a world with nothing in it but evil. You see on TV every night probably lately this thing called ISIS. And the commands that they're issuing uh, on TV and social media, and they're instructing their people, their soldiers, that unless somebody believes in Allah, you are to kill them. It doesn't matter what religion they are, if they're not, basically if you're not a Sunni Muslim, and they are the only ones in the Muslim world who believe that Muhammad came and Muhammad wrote the, the Quran and all that stuff, if, and, and he appointed everybody to Allah. So if you fail to believe that, they say to their men, what it says in the Quran, smite them above their neck. Beheading is what it's called. Or kill them. And you've seen them machine gunning their own Shiite Muslim brothers, 380 of them I saw on TV, getting mowed down with machine guns into a shallow grave. And 13 of them actually lived and could tell the story on uh, 60 Minutes, I guess it was, on a Sunday night. Anyway, I digress. So, my whole point here is, is the Bible, do you believe the Bible is inspired by God and written by men? If so, there are no mistakes in there. There are no errors in that book. Nowhere. I've never found any. I found mysteries which, after careful study, every one of them was solved. You know, why, why would he say this here and somebody else would say that there? But when you get into God's Word and study it out and ask God, by his Holy Spirit to enlighten you and open your eyes up so that you can understand what he wrote to us. He does that. He actually, as long as you're willing to work and get in there, he exposes things so that you can see them crystal clear. Um, so remember, your eternity, why it's so important is your eternity depends on those two words, born again. Jesus said it. His writers wrote it. This book is inspired, so all you have to do is believe that this book is true and that everything that Jesus said and did is uh, correct. And we have a link here on YouTube where if you go there, it'll show you Bible verses of why you need a Savior. Uh, and there's a little prayer there, as I said so many times, probably weekly, where if you repeat something like that but mean it, then the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be born again. Okay, and then he will send his Holy Spirit to dwell within you. So with that, I hope you learned something, and I'll see you guys next week with another message. This is what I do. This is my mission. So thanks for sticking out. Whether it's one that comes or 300 that come, that's up to God, not me. My job is to just deliver the word as he uh, moves me to do so. So I'll see you guys next week. Thanks for stopping by.